This chapter is called One Sunday Morning. Winters in Cache Valley can be long and severe, but they can sparkle also. A heavy snowstorm may leave a foot or more of snow and the whole landscape white, clear to the mountains across the valley. The storm is usually followed by a clear, deep blue sky and warm, sun, uh, warm afternoon sun, followed by a heavy nighttime frost. In a day or two, we'll be walking on top of the diamond sparkling snow. On just such a day, Papa and I were walking hand in hand through the snow over the long blocks toward the meeting house. It was Sunday, uh, it was, and the state conference was to be held in our little village, but I knew little of that. What I did know and do remember was that I was all alone with my father. What a wonderful experience that was for both of us. In those days, no one had ever thought of the need a little child has to be alone once in a while with a parent. Many of the needs of children were yet to be recognized and understood. I never remember of it ever happening with either parent. State conferences in those days were held turnabout in the various wards of the state, especially in the rural areas, and it was our turn. The attendance was sparse, as I remember, probably due to the isolation of our little town and the hours of travel by sleigh and teams over the hard-packed roads, of the snow-packed roads. Once inside the meeting house, I went up to the front bench, as was customary for children at, the, at any gathering. I looked up at the people on the stand and I saw two men I had never seen before, which is, in itself was unusual in our little town. One was an older man with white hair and one of the kindest faces I had ever seen. And the other was much younger. His hair was dark, as were his eyes which sparkled when he looked down at us and smiled. We were told that they were general authorities of the church, a term that would be familiar to us for the rest of our lives. The older man was an apostle, Anthony W. Ivins, and the younger man was a newly appointed patriarch to the church, Hiram G. Smith. Of the meeting I remember little, but the feeling I had when those two brethren much of it must have been directed to us little children. I remember that Brother Smith said, When I was a little boy, my mother used newspapers to paper a little back room that we had. And that is how I learned to read, it was from those newspapers. But I had one problem. Sometimes the newspapers had been pasted on upside down, so I had to stand on my head to read them. Brother Ivans had spent much of his adult life in the desert southwest on various errands and appointments for the church. He must have been talking about that. I only remember one thing, the story of the little mockingbird mother and her four baby birds and the father mockingbird nearby. A violent storm had killed the mother bird as she protected her baby birds. And the men buried the mother bird, Brother Ivans and his people that were traveling with him, buried the mother bird beneath the tree, and the father nurtured the baby birds until they flew away. How I loved that story, and the man who told it on that beautiful, cold winter morning. I left the meeting never doubting that Brother Ivans was my grandfather. Thirty years later, I was helping your father raise a family Taylorsville, where he was president of the Cottonwood State Mission. One weekend, the church had sent Antoine R. Ivins to the state to hold a missionary conference, and he was the son of Anthony W. Ivins. And at the close of the meeting, I was introduced to Brother Ivins and told him about hearing the Mockingbird story from his father when I was a little girl. And he said, Sister Collier, would you like a copy of that story? Of course I would. I had no idea it had ever been written down. In a few days, I received a little book that threw the mail 
which was a printed copy of an address given by Anthony W. Ivins at the formal opening of the Union Pacific's Grand Canyon Lodge, September 15, 1928. As he closed his address, he told that simple story to that audience of officials and leaders of business and industry and government and church. And I held in my hand one of the treasures of my library and of my life as I remember that beautiful Sunday morning when I was a little girl. And then I've added some notes about the foregoing. President Ivins was born in 1852, which made him somewhere in his 60s when he was in Newton that day. I have no date of that visit, but I have an idea that I was about eight years of age, which checks out with the newly appointed patriarch to the church, who was appointed in 1912. Many years later, I was at a conference in the Logan Tabernacle, sitting close by the stand in the balcony. I watched as the officers and teachers made their way to the stand. One of them I did not recognize at first. He had steel gray hair, but when he turned, I knew that it, who he was in spite of his gray hair and the aging facial features. Those eyes could not be mistaken. It was President Hiram G. Smith. His son, his son Elder G. Smith, did not immediately succeed him, but he was our bishop in the 20th Ward in Salt Lake for a time. Since I spent three years at Brigham Young College in Logan, Brother Ivans became a familiar figure. He was ordained to be an apostle in 1907 and became counselor to Heber J. Grant in 1921. Elder Ivans will, however, be always associated with the Southwest as he spent most of his adult life there on various missions and assignments. He was sent by Brigham Young to Tokerville near Zions Park early in his life as part of the Cotton Mission. He was sent as one of the seven elders to open the first mission in Mexico. Sent to, a, to aid the Mormon refugees fleeing, fleeing their homes at the time of the revolutions in Mexico and served seven years as a far as state president in Mexico, traveling most of the time on horseback to Salt Lake or wherever he needed to go to visit. For me, there is a mystery and a romance about that southern country. For those who were part of its exploration, pioneering, and colonization, it would have other dimensions. I have only to see it by way of the automobile and the stories they left. Jacob Hamlin, John D. Lee, Major Powell, Human Jones, Poland Leroy. My own grandparents called on a 10-year mission to Canaan to help colonize, and the birth of my mother in a lonely log cabin owned by the church in the hills above Moccasin Springs over the line in Arizona. I had my own introduction to that part of the country in an unforgettable trip with my uncle they had newly acquired automobiles and wanted to fulfill a lifetime dream of returning to the place of their boyhood. I wept when I first saw the red soil of fields and gardens and the outcropping of the red rock on the hillside just out of Canaan. I had heard about this from my mother and others, but I hardly believed it. We walked up to the side of the log cabin with old Indian George, who had remembered the family 40 years before. We were scheduled to go to the Grand Canyon, but we hardly knew what it was. But in the last hundred miles or so, the service station attendants tried to prepare us for what we were going to see at the Grand Canyon by scaring us to death. The tension built as we followed the little paths out to Bright Angel Point for we came upon that great gash in the earth's crust, one mile deep, 13 miles across. I wish I had read the exclamation made by Adelaide Crepsey when she stood, or we stood, and she said, By Zeus, shout the word of this to the oldest dead titans and gods and heroes. Come, 
who have once more a home. During a near during a near four year res during a four year residence in Cedar City, we got quite well acquainted with Cedar Break, Zion Canyon, the Black Ridge that lured us into tropical dictionary the, uh, the tropical Dixie, where we heard the stories of our friend William R. Palmer. However, it is far, the far away vistas that stir me most and provide the mystery. You round the curve and 50 miles away are those immense tablelands, ominous, mysterious, This is a picture, if you can pick it out, of the Red Hills in Canaan. And this is Heather. And they're looking across the, the landscape, right at the, in the foreground, if you can see it, is the, where the flood came down that finally uh, induced my grandparents to leave the country down there and go back to their home. Terrible flood and it did a lot of destruction that's been written about. And we'll record that sometime later. This is Cedar uh, uh, Breaks. Now, from the distance, Cedar City. The way it looks like uh, water out there, but it's desert. That's the other Oh, that's right, I've got the wrong picture. But this is a panoramic view of Cedar Break. And I just point I'm standing at the same place. I just pointed the camera down into the cavity. I forgot to get this picture to show the colors. Of course, that's something we don't see in 